Bring in my panel, Labor MP Luke Gosling and Liberal Senator James Patterson. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Thanks Patricia. Patricia. Let's park John Secker, although we might talk about him a little. Let's just talk about drought, because it really is the most important issue facing the country on so many levels. Uh, at the moment, it's kind of a crisis situation. We've heard now from the National Farmers Federation asking for exit packages for farmers. There's other things they're asking for too, but exit packages is clearly very contentious. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, James. Do you think that should be considered, given for some farmers, long-term viability is a big issue? The government will definitely be considering all of the suggestions made by the National Farmers Federation in their submission to government today. Uh, we are welcoming all good ideas in this space because the drought is a very serious challenge and we are very committed to tackling it. Whether we'll adopt that particular proposal or not, I honestly can't say at this stage, Patricia, I don't know. Uh, there are good arguments for and against that particular measure. Governments in the past have uh, resorted to measures like that, um, but there are reasons why you might not want to do that at this time as well. So the government will consider that and weigh it up against all the other other ideas that have been proposed. OK. What's your instinct on this? Oh, look, I, I can see both sides of it because on the one hand, uh, it's a perfectly acceptable thing for a farmer in this climate to decide uh, that they want to leave the land and to want some assistance to do so. Um, at the same time, uh, we want to encourage any farmer who can to stay on the land and get through what will be a difficult period and, and come out on the other side of it. Uh, so it's a line ball call. Luke Gosling, why has Labor shut this down? Uh, it's an idea that clearly farmers have generated. Some of them clearly look at their long-term prospects, look at the modelling and say, there may not be a long-term future for me. Why not help those farmers? Oh, we're absolutely committed to helping farmers and that's why Anthony Albanese's uh, called for a drought cabinet. I mean. Uh, a war well, cabinet. You're not addressing because... my issue. I'm, I'm asking you about the exiting of, of off farm, off the land, because they think we just can't keep doing this. Why shouldn't the government assist those people to leave the land? Well, of course we'll consider anything, but the report that uh, General Day has written hasn't been released yet. I mean, the whole fact that this is a crisis situation doesn't seem to be taking, taken too seriously by this government. And what we've seen as they kick people on uh, household packages, um, that helping people on the land, that's what this government's doing. It just seems they don't want to spend uh, any funds on helping people on the land. They know it is a drought emergency, but to, to my mind, they seem more intent on playing the politics and doing the nationals politics and where, where any funding that may come out to help in the near term uh, might go based on political considerations. So I, I think what they need to do is release the plan that uh, the Major General who's come up with this uh, strategy in his report has made uh, and so we can work together in a bipartisan way, get past the politics and uh, get some uh, assistance out there to the farmers, not in a year but soon. I'd like to find out what you think on this, James. There's been reports and actually I have, I have some of the proposal myself right in front of me from the Nationals that a new fund should be essentially set up, a $10 million per shire fund, 50-50 funded by the state and the federal government to essentially deal with drought. What do you make of those, that sort of funding idea? We have a program a little bit similar to that already, not of that scale, but it, it gives about a million dollars per shire. And it's the not purpose 10 of that though, is, is it? No, it's not. You're right. That's why I acknowledge it's not the same scale. But uh, it, the purpose of that is, is recognising that it's not only farmers who are affected in a time of drought, but it's all the people who live in and around farms that are affected too. Local tradespeople, small businesses, the community. Uh, and so those measures are going direct into communities, I believe, through local councils, which I think is a, you know, an appropriate way to fund these sorts of mechanisms to, through another tier of government, uh, where it goes through the kind of normal, robust uh, processes that you need to do when you're spending public money. OK, let's move away from drought and just touch on that big issue in relation to John Secker we were talking about a little earlier, which is, you know, fairly contentious. I'll start with you, Luke Gosling. Should the Labor Party still be taking money from the CFMEU? The government says uh, that this is a credibility issue for Anthony Albanese. He might talk about John Secker, but John Secker is still the leader of this union. Should Labor still be taking money from the CFMEU? 
Oh, a union's uh, not defined by one particular member of that union, and there's plenty of CFMEU members um, that do a fantastic uh, job for their members, um, keeping workplaces safe. Uh, so I just think that's a normal line, anti-union, anti-CFMEU, anti-worker line that we see from this government. So I don't see it as that relevant. I think Anthony has been very clear uh, in what he has uh, been doing with the John Setker issue right from the start, one of the first things he did on becoming uh, opposition leader. Uh, so I think it's good that this has come about today, that Mr Setker has withdrawn uh, that appeal to the process, um, but we still maintain uh, the very important role that unions uh, play in our country and uh, we'll continue uh, to work constructively with them to make sure that workers are kept safe um, and that they're properly remunerated. James Patterson, uh, look, the government will try and put point score on this, but ultimately this is an example of Anthony Albanese actually being successful, isn't it? He said he wanted to get rid of this guy and he essentially has. Well, he's a few months behind schedule, Patricia, and in the end, John Setka was not expelled. He resigned, and regardless well, because of whether he was he's facing a... expulsion. Indeed, but uh, he's, he chose to resign rather than being expelled. Uh, and, and though he may not be a card-carrying member of the Labor Party any longer, he remains a leader within the CFMEU in Victoria, and his union controls a significant, significant number of votes at the Labor conference in Victoria, which ultimately has say over who, who is endorsed as a Labor MP. So he retains influence over the Labor Party, and the Labor Party has so far taken no steps to address that issue. Uh, John Setker is a man who may, remains incredibly influential in Labor politics. And for, if Anthony Albanese really sincerely believes that John Setka is a problem and he shouldn't have influence over Labor politics, he has to address that issue. James Patterson, Andrew Hastie is reportedly heading over to China in December. This is despite heavy criticism of Beijing in, uh, in the past that he's been making. Are you going on that trip too? I've also been invited to, to go on that trip and uh, like Andrew from time to time I've had uh, critical things to say uh, about the Chinese Communist Party. It doesn't mean that I don't value the relationship with China though and it doesn't mean that I'm not interested in understanding the Chinese people better. Uh, in fact I, I think that'll be a great opportunity for both Andrew and I uh, but we won't miss the opportunity while we're there to raise the concerns that we've expressed here in Australia about human rights in China, about uh, the Uyghur people, about Hong Kong, about the, the Australian citizen who's currently detained uh, in China, uh, Dr Yang, uh, who is a writer who's been detained on charges that we think are spurious. Who are you going to raise these concerns with? Uh, well, we don't know who we're meeting with yet, Patricia, and we'll find out in due course. But uh, any opportunity that we have to raise this, uh, we, particularly if we meet with any Chinese government officials, we'll do so. My understanding is that the China Matters Tour doesn't actually facilitate meetings with Chinese government officials, so you probably actually won't have that access, right? Uh, my understanding is it, is it does, uh, and in fact, uh, on a recent trip with China Matters uh, to China only a few weeks ago, uh, Richard Miles and Tanya Plibersek met with Chinese government officials. Unfortunately, while they were there, they did not raise, raise the case of the Australian citizen detained in China, which I think would have been a really good opportunity for them to do so. Um, if we have that opportunity, we will do so. OK, but you don't, you're not sure if you will, right? That's the thing. This, this, in terms of access, this trip, it's been raised to me that this trip doesn't actually provide that kind of access. Well, I was invited a few days ago, Patricia, and the program is not yet finalised. Uh, but in the invitation from China Matters, it said that uh, we'll be meeting with civil society leaders, uh, business people and government officials. We saw the Prime Minister over the weekend meet with China's Vice President. The Prime Minister later said that he was pleased that there is a very clear understanding of where Australia is coming from, our commitment to the relationship. I'll start with you, James Patterson, and then I'll hear from Luke. Is that position clear to you? Because Labor's been making the case that it's just not clear. Well, Labor's position is shifting on China, so I can understand why they would say it's not clear. Uh, well, on isn't the one your hand, position they... shifting too? No, I don't think it is. I think the government's been very clear, um, particularly uh, in recent years, about the need for Australia to be assertive about our values and about our sovereignty, and at the same time about having a very high level of engagement with China on the economic front. They are a very important economic partner and we recognise that. And we're very proud of the fact that it was under our government that we achieved a free trade agreement with China, something that Labor was not able to do. But at the same time, while we pursue those economic opportunities, we're not going to be silent uh, when our values come to conflict. OK, we've, we've heard Luke Gosling f uh, from Tuvalu's uh, 
former Prime Minister about China's influence in the region, calling it disturbing. What responsibility do we have to our Pacific neighbours to deal with this issue? Well, for a start, the government needs to start taking climate action seriously. That is the number one issue for people in the Pacific. And if you can't pretend that you've got a family uh, relationship there unless you're taking their number one issue seriously. And look, I, not, uh, I haven't met the uh, former PM of uh, Tuvalu, but obviously uh, there are strategic tensions in our region uh, and we need to be doing everything we can to play an active and constructive role um, to ensure people are talking. Now, I think it's uh, positive that the Prime Minister had a meeting uh, recently on the, on the sidelines in Jakarta, um, but he really made a mess of things when he was in the United States. There's a lot more sophistication that's required in uh, balancing both our relationship with the United States and playing a constructive role as a middle power in the Indo-Pacific uh, and our relationship with China. They are different relationships. Uh, the Chinese are very important uh, to Australia's economy. But as James said, that doesn't mean uh, that we don't raise issues of concern. Uh, when it comes to the United States, they are friends. So and our ally, our most important ally. Uh, so we should uh, continue to play a constructive role in having more understanding in our region and addressing the concerns uh, that uh, the Pacific Islands in particular do have. Just finally on a very domestic and very important issue, and that is TAFE spending. In the Senate estimates, we've heard that the government underspent $214 million in vocational education and training programs in the last financial year. This isn't the first time that the government has been reported to have underspent on these kinds of services on this issue. We know that the controversy around the NDIS is still, of course, there. Does the government... Uh, have an issue around TAFE. I'll start with you, James Patterson, because this isn't just an issue that Labor's pursuing. You've also made Jackie Lambie rather cranky. Patricia, as you would know from your many years of reporting in the social services space, but many of your viewers might not, there are two ways governments can spend money. A specific amount for a specific purpose, or they can set up the criteria by which people are eligible to access funding and then make a forecast or an estimate of how much funding is going to be spent in that area. Now, that's what's happened in this case. The forecast was made about how much was spent, demand was not as strong as it was anticipated, and so less has been spent. The government's taken no decision to take any money away, and anyone who met the criteria who applied received the funding that they expected to receive. So this is just the normal variations in government expenditure which the Labor Party is trying to turn into a political issue. But their record in government is that they actually made a policy decision to take $1.2 billion out of the vocational training space and that led to the largest drop in history of 110,000 places in apprenticeships in Australia. So we won't be taking lectures from Labor on this. OK, Luke, not taking lectures, the department said in estimates that the underspend is because of low demand. They said that the Gillard government changed employer incentives to take on apprentices in 2012 and apprenticeships dropped by 100,000, actually, between 2012 and 2013. So, you know, there's more to this story, isn't it? There's more than just the headline item here. Where does Labor stand on this issue? I mean, there is actually a lot of history here. We stand with Chinese and we stand with the but TAFE system. But always. And I think people out there understand that. I mean, what we've just heard is someone representing a government that after six years and 150,000 less apprentices uh, is trying to um, suggest that the, the lack of demand at the moment has got absolutely nothing to do with them cutting the guts out of the system. Now, our young people uh, deserve uh, a chance in trades, uh, but industry also needs those skills. Uh, and after six years of government, you would expect uh, that they have a plan, but they have no plan. And it doesn't matter, Patricia, whether we're talking about the drought, which is an absolute national crisis, they haven't got a plan. They won't re release the report when it comes to um, the Pacific, the Indo-Pacific. They haven't got a plan. And they tore up Julie Bishop's uh, foreign affairs white paper and just went totally off script, the Prime Minister did in the United States. And when it comes to TAFE and training of Australia's next generation that we're going to need to get our economy going, they haven't got a plan there either. All right. I'm going to have to leave it there. Thanks to both of you. Thanks, Patricia.